Well, thank you so much for sticking with us throughout the entire day. Um, we have had a slew of really fascinating conversations on so many different topics. And this one is so broad, but we really do have people with um, special perspectives. So I feel very privileged. My name is Marcina Tillman. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Global Watching Business Council. I feel very privileged to be joined by this esteemed panel. Um, we have Thomas Harjano, who's the Chief Technology Officer of MIT Net. We have Marta Belcher, who is an attorney at Ropes and Gray. Kale Pauling, who is the co-founder of Cache, and who also was in the Estonian Parliament for 12 years, is that correct? And Alex, I always remember your last name. Love you. Yes. Um, who is the director of digital and IR at Sensorium. Yes. Yes. Very cool job. So to start things off, I was hoping Kale could walk us through a little bit of what Estonia has done because it's truly remarkable. It's a country of 1.3 million people and yet they have one of the most advanced digital societies in the world. And I'm curious to kind of get a picture of what it looks like now. What are the digital advances? been able to drive through over the last decade, and maybe what are some of the areas you're still looking to innovate in? I think it's easier to uh, to name just a few things that you can't do uh, online. Uh, it's getting married, divorced, uh, buying and selling a real estate. So everything else can be done digitally. So um, otherwise, just the line would be so long. So basically, we have 2,800 different key services that's provided by public sector and private sector. It all relies on trust and collaboration. So uh, if I mention trust, and uh, just uh, echoing the uh, previous panel, uh, where it was said that in many countries, uh, people don't trust the government. So in our case, we can say that uh, when it comes to digitalization, digital services, uh, this, let's say, client uh, sales pro uh, service provider relationship that the citizens and the state has. So, Estonian uh, citizens, they do trust uh, the government, even though we might not have, uh, let's say, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the parties and the, their their political views. So, good the government in place at the moment, but still they believe that the foundation where the uh, e-governance is, uh, is built uh, on is uh, secure enough, is, uh, let's say, innovative enough that uh, it, could be, uh, it could be trusted. And how do you educate the public about these advances? Because these aren't really new changes. Many of them happened a decade ago, if I'm not incorrect and they were real sea changes in terms of what was possible, um, having a digital identity, for example. How do you instill trust in the public now that you have it? Can you talk us a little bit, um, talk to us a little bit about the process? I guess if we would start now, then uh, of course the challenges would be much larger because of the, let's say, different data, um, different scandals around data that we've had during the last years, but when we started in the 2000s, First uh, service was uh, was in text and customer support. So in one hand, uh, people understood and they got the experience that uh, you can declare your taxes in five minutes instead of I mean uh, filling five fifty pages uh, in some Excel uh, Excel table. And on the other hand, they understood that if uh, the paying taxes is uh, so simple. Actually, we saw the increase of tax morals. So basically, it was no idea to cheat the government because the declaring was so easy. And afterwards, we let's say changed and fine tuned the system in a way that uh, that one of the last changes we did was uh, just um, let's say it was one application which helped us to double check if uh, if uh, some, if the VAT that we declared. Is, uh, is truly declared, declared or not. And this gave us 7% of uh, extra VAT annually. And 7% of VAT extra is 100 million euros. So basically, we collected 100 million more by just changing one, one application in the system without increasing the tax. So everybody benefited from that. And that's basically 
may be something that you, let's say, community in fact, with society, and then everybody, let's say, society understands that the, uh, that the changes are, uh, are needed. Of course, there are always different, let's say, stakeholders and parties in the society that, uh, that do believe that that uh, more transparency is, is bad in a way, uh, but uh, but we understood the reasons. Be, uh, but we understand. I think we all understand the reasons behind it. And so so there are there are certain certain interest uh, interest behind it. And uh, when we let's say advocate the e-governance uh, in different countries worldwide, then if, uh, if the let's say uh, if the let's say uh, colleague on the other side of the table who would like to build up the e-government, the e-government society understands that uh, there will be sign on every step you do, then uh, we see some, let's say, decrease of the, of the interest because not all the societies and not all the governments are interested in transparency. So, so but yes, we, we did the other way around and that's why we have the trust by our citizens. And you spoke a little bit about digital identity, which is often viewed as kind of the holy grail of digitization and all of these new advances because it unlocks so many other possible benefits and applications. Um, Thomas, you do a lot of work on that at MIT. Can you talk us through a little bit of what you're working on? Sure. So, so uh, talking about digital identities predates blockchain. For those who are old enough, uh, remember, uh, you know, years ago, and uh, you know, all the fact that uh, in the United States, at least, that was a four year, five year thing in the making. And at that stage, we had the same problem. So if you had somebody wielding a public key, uh, how do you bind, uh, you know, how do you prove ownership that I legally own uh, the public key versus maybe, maybe Martha stole it from me, right? So, so she, she's a nice person. She wouldn't, she wouldn't do that, I know that. I, I trust you. Uh, so, so uh, this, uh, you know, the, the advent of, of blockchain and the ability to transact directly using cryptography key pairs has, has brought, you know, back again into the, into the uh, you know, narrative, the discussion, how do you bind uh, information, reputation information with the public key, right? And so when you start talking about uh, reputation, as the previous session was talking about, this is where personal data comes in, right? And so this be brings a whole host of questions about, about data. So we've been saying in our group that really the digital identity problem translates to personal data, privacy, uh, and I invite you to read a 2014 report from the World Economic Forum, WEF. Uh, it's entitled Rethinking Personal Data, and uh, it's quite straightforward in saying uh, that there is, there has been a decrease of trust in institutions. This is what, you know, if you guys were in the last hour here, same problem of uh, distrust, increase, increasing distrust. And, and how do you fix that, right? And, and personal, uh, personal data and how personal data is protected, uh, how you empower individuals to make use of their own copy, you know, of the personal data is gonna play an important role for digital identity. Thank you so much. I think we've all heard the phrase, data is the new oil. And Marta and Alex, I would love to get your perspective on how we use data both effectively and responsibly to manage this digital transformation. Lady first, okay? Hmm? Ladies first, okay? Ladies sure, first, I'm, happy yeah. to go, I'm happy to go first on that. Um, so I think one of the things that is uh, so cool about blockchain um, that sort of gets a little bit lost in the data conversation um, is the ability to transact anonymously and privately. Um, and when we talk about the digitization of everything, I always think back to um, during the Hong Kong protests, you can see pictures um, of people lined up in the subway stations and they're waiting, there's this huge line and they're waiting to buy their tickets to the subway in cash, right? Um, because they don't want to have a record of them being on the subway at that time. And so there is something that gets lost when you talk about the digitization of everything. And the thing that to me is so cool about blockchain is that you can actually digitize things but still keep that anonymity. Yeah, um, just add a couple of things. Like we are the people and we are really focused on implementing really advanced technologies. 
but we are still thinking with the old methods using our industrial age, like we need the paper, we need the evidence, you know, everything stuff. I think we need to leave industrial age behind. We, we need to leave all principles of industrial age behind. We need to go further with new principles. That's the whole idea because technology is give us ability to act differently now. This is the whole point and this, the idea to act differently give us ability to execute different principles of trust, of integrity, of values. Identity is a new principle, for example. We, I, do, I don't need any more power, I don't need any more to be focused on money because this distributed economy give me ability to build a Tesla in my garage. Okay, So I don't need a gigafactories anymore. I believe that the people need to think to reshape their minds uh, because the technology now already have the ability, future is now. And that's the whole point. And we need to think because, hey guys, we have finally the tools to reshape the world, okay? Um, and I think with all of these new opportunities, there are so many inherent risks that maybe we don't, um, we haven't been able to anticipate. And so I think this is a question that is probably relevant for all of you, but I'd love to hear about some of those risks um, and kind of the way that data is empowering certain individuals and making others more vulnerable and maybe some of the methods you would encourage to mitigate those risks. The first one, maybe me, myself, okay, if you don't mind. So um, I can say there is a two strategies of data. Is a, first is protection strategy. When I protect the data and I protect the company from the additional extra exposure, from getting out the data somewhere else, okay? And the second strategy is strategy when I'm planning the attack on the market. I'm planning to get the new profit using the data. So I believe, I believe the companies in this situation should be balanced both strategies because inside the company, these both strategies are conquering against the resources of the company. Any other thoughts on how data is empowering or maybe putting certain individuals at risk? Sure. So, so one thing, um, you know, of course, is when you have a bunch of data and you're a company, um, it, the, the question of under what circumstances you're willing to hand that over to whom is a really, really important question for companies. Um, and in the tech space, um, but much less so in the financial space, um, transparency reporting has become very, very popular, where you say, um, first of all, um, here are what our policies are, you know, and you're transparent about it, um, and when we will hand over data, and also um, reports after the fact of, you know, we got 100 requests for this type of data from you know, the government of X last year, right? Um, and, and having that type of transparency um, it is huge. Um, and that's something that I think financial companies and companies um, in this space have yet to really adopt. I agree. We have a couple of technologists on the stage, and so I'd love to hear more about the technical infrastructure that's really needed to secure this sensitive data, whether it's within reach or whether we're still kind of building it out and figuring out how to secure all of that personal information. Sure, so, so uh, in the area of cryptography, one of the, uh, my background is cryptography, PhD in cryptography, a long time ago. Um, one of the sort of holy grails for cryptography is being able to do some degree of computation on encrypted data, right? So, so right now, uh, so to use a Gartner term, they use the term data at rest protection. It just means that corporations need to encrypt their data in the back end. Uh, the problem is that a simple straightforward encryption doesn't allow you to do computation. You have to decrypt, load it up to your memory, do computation, flush or re-encrypt, right? But uh, new technologies are coming soon, hopefully, um, that allow you to do computation uh, while the data is at rest at encrypted. It's right now, it's restricted. You can do, for example, uh, additions, subtractions, uh, average computations, but you can't do the complex data analytics that you know we're so used to that we take for granted, right? So, so that's kind of the you know in terms of technology, that's kind of on the you know hopefully H2 Horizon 2, Horizon 3, if you guys know what H1, H2, H3 is, uh, and you know I look I look forward to that day and 
and you know, there's, there are attempts there's initiatives today to begin standardizing, standardizing homomorphic encryption algorithms, if you guys know what that is. In fact, you know, Microsoft and, and a few other companies are leading that charge because they're trying to get the market to agree on certain standard parameters. Just like if you guys know about um, you know, public key cryptography, there are standards on key length, standards on you know, uh, the, the difficulty of computation, J just like in, in Bitcoin. Bitcoin essentially uh, defined ahead of time, this is the key length, this is difficulty, and so on. So, so hopefully in the next, I don't know, five years, if I was <laughs> optimistic, we, we might get there. Uh, Tom, I have a different opinion. I don't agree because uh, seven years ago, I was in charge for implementation of the biggest uh, big data solution on banking sector in Russia. It was a lot, believe me, it was a lot. It was a huge cost. Seven years later now, I read article uh, on the Medium from the guy, CTO, I think it was CTO of Samstack, and he wrote the article how to build infrastructure for the big data for 40 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, said, what? And I just, really? And I tried, I really tried, and I opened the uh, uh, different types of open source projects. It's about 36 open source projects I figured out. At the moment, there is Airflow ETL instrument, which is open source and free again. So it means all together, for 40 bucks, everyone, everyone, not the corporations, everyone can build a very nice infrastructure to manage the data in their house, in their garage. We don't need any anymore the huge corporations like Google to manage the data, and that's the whole point. Because we will, we work already on distributed infrastructures framework. So that's I, when I realized it, I was like, no way. So, so actually, I, I absolutely agree with you, Alex. So the previous session, there was this phrase that that got uh, uh, discussed, and that is the idea of a cooperative, right? So, so you know, m my mom who's whatever, 80 something years old, I mean, she's not gonna be able to manage her own data, right? Whether it's x-ray data, whether it's credit card transaction data, location data, not that she <coughs> goes around a lot with her iPhone, but she is generating location data. But what if you could have uh, citizens, each citizens uh, being uh, given access to uh, their own data, right? So, and, and, you, and where, do you, where do you keep it, right? And so, uh, if it's just, you know, five data stores, well, you know, you, you can't really do interesting analytics, but if you had 50,000, and so the question then becomes, and you're the lawyer here, um, what legal construct can we use to enable a community of 50,000 data holder citizens to get together? So we call that a data cooperative, and we're studying the credit union model in the United States because of this, uh, you know, there's a fiduciary obligation when you are a credit union. Credit union, they, they don't call them people customers, they call them members. So if you go to a credit union in the US, you know, oh, you know, you're a member, right? So it is a member-owned, member-driven, uh, you know, with, with, you know, voting structured on the board and, and policy setting, and it's optional. If you, if you join and they change the policy and you don't like it, you can leave and, and take your data away. And the key thing is, is, is that in that setup, data must never leave the repository, right? So if you need to compute something, pull in the algorithms, run it within your infrastructure, and then you know, uh, return aggregate, aggregate results. Because, because in aggregate results, you don't have the opportunity to re-identify somebody, which is really the privacy, privacy challenge. Kale and Marta, I would love to get your perspective on how we might create a governance system for these different collaboratives. Because it would be very complex, but um, I think both of you have uh, experience that would be relevant to kind of building a paradigm for them. <laughs> so eager to answer this one. <laughs> wow. Uh, basically, I think that we'll need to create services that people need. And, uh, and there is some point of, I mean, finding out what information this and that kind of agency in the States has about you. I mean, let's take e-healthcare system. So if I would have time, I can show on, uh, on the screen my case summary, for example. I visited a doctor two weeks ago. I can see exactly who was the doctor, what was done, how much it uh, basically cost, uh, al although it's covered by this, let's say, solidary uh, insurance uh, system, but, uh, but still. 
uh, and if I don't want to show this information to anybody, I can close it. So basically, if there is something sensitive, and I'm still afraid that something could be somewhere, uh, I can close it. Uh, although uh, I can claim basically uh, the doctor who has misused the information. So if uh, he or she doesn't didn't have any, let's say, reason to visit my case summary, then I can uh, I can claim her. Uh, claim them, and uh, and it's basically written in the law. So uh, during this uh, digital digitalization process, uh, I guess that the most important minister is not the minister of digitalization; it's the minister of justice. So all the basically all the procedures, all the codes must be described on a on a legislative level as well. So if you take it on the pieces, you'll find out who was uh, who was basically guilty, and uh, and uh, then you can uh, then you can avoid. Uh, that kind of uh, that kind of um, uh, misuses. So this is in one point, and on the other point, uh, in the private sector field in EU, luckily we have GDPR, which is let's say covering some of the sectors. But I guess that uh, it gave a very good hint to other sectors as well, meaning that uh, data should be owned by the person or the client itself. Uh, I myself uh, co-founded a company in the field of insurance, so basically making insurance more uh, more personal. And in the first, let's say, three months that we've been on the market, uh, we, we see already that some of our customers have already saved uh, six times in their insurance payments, because so far all the insurance payments are based on uh, uh, averages in terms of their premium calculations. But if I would ask from the audience, who wants to be an aver average person? I guess nobody. So. We all would like to have this personal treatment, and if the services are not there, then uh, then we can't talk about, let's say, this inclusion and uh, and the will from the from the customer side. So, uh, if we talk about enabling all the innovative services, we still have, let's say, we still have uh, uh, debates in some of the countries that uh, should the already old school let's say uh, commuting platform uber be uh, enabled or legalized or not we did it already in 2016 uh, but still some countries are arguing about it but uh, it's not something that politicians wanted to regulate it's uh, it's the demand from the customer side because they were not happy with the let's say uh, current uh, way of uh, of uh, on demand uh, uh, transportation in this, let's say, old school, uh, old school taxi system, which, which somebody uh, clearly said before, that uh, this kind of business model uh, reached their gap, uh, I think, 20 years ago. So th there was a taxi meter and the plafond and the stop on the street. So, so basically, there is no need for that kind of services. Maybe just, let's say, commuting between airport and the center of the city. But, but basically, let's say, if there is a demand on the uh, on the customer side, there should be a will and knowledge from the regulator side to at least, let's say, look into it. Does it need any, so, any kind of regulation if it needs? Or we have this, let's say, general data protection uh, principles like GDPR is in some cases. Uh, then, uh, then maybe it doesn't need to be uh, uh, regulated at all. So, so that in, in principle that, uh, that all the things must be regulated. And one last thing which I see as a biggest challenge and where, let's say, all of us here and the elite as such must uh, take responsibility is educating the decision makers. So if we, let's say, uh, watch at YouTube the discussion around, uh, let's say, this Cambridge Analytica scandal, I mean, in, in, the, in the Senate or in some parliaments, uh, also in the uh, let's say uh, UK UK Parliament in the special committee and, and luckily we have Netflix who has let's say made a great movie uh, which is called Great Hack. So so basically we find out from there in uh, uh, that in what level the decision makers are in their knowledge. So we have some visionaries in each of the states, but but in most of the cases the decision makers take the position to reflect back the, the fears for the society instead of, let's say, trying to find out what's behind of the, the technology, what's behind the blockchain technology. It's not just Bitcoin like in most of the countries still, let's say, people understand that, uh, that this technology is just, let's say, one cryptocurrency. 
So, uh, so, so, so this is the challenge, and, and I think that this, that this, let's say, we should focus on because otherwise, we are in a deep crisis someday, like we ha like we are currently with the uh, climate policy and uh, and climate crisis. So let's try to make this digitalization approach alike that we don't have to call it the crisis in a few years' time, because currently it heads to this direction. Uh, just to add to that, um, I uh, think one of the coolest uses of blockchain is actually in this space um, and, and making sort of what you're talking about possible. Um, because one of the things that if, you're, if you do own your data, right, and you, you do have preferences, one of the things you have to be able to do is uh, connect your data to those preferences. And so a really cool use case, for example, let's say you have your genomic data. Uh, you might want to be able to say, I'm totally fine with researchers using this for genomic research, but I don't want advertisers to have access to my genomic data to know what to target me with, right? Um, and so one cool use for blockchain is to be able to say, um, tie your preferences, you know, make, keep track of your preferences on a blockchain, and using smart contracts automatically only unlock your data to folks who are using it for the use cases that you've expressed your preferences for. Um, so a, a cool use case that I think is, is super enabling in this space. Uh, uh, can, I, can I comment on one thing? I, I think that we, we should step further from this model where one, in one side of the table is the database with the genomics data, for example, and on the other side of the table is the advertiser. So, so I mean, still, the, between this is the people who owns that genoma let's say, in, in, in principle, or who has it, and uh, they can play a role there as well. Should I, mm -hmm. Will I open the data for the, for the advertiser, or will I open the data for the, some sort of, let's say, future platform where we have the, let's say, best specialists in, in, uh, in, in finding solution for some sort of disease which is predicted through my genoma. This is also something that we are piloting currently in our country, so basically we have, we are in the, let's say, final stage of collecting 100,000 gene samples from uh, our citizens. So basically, it's one, it's 10% of our uh, society almost. So, uh, so, and and we we try to make this, let's say, pilot in personalized uh, uh, medicine, and still uh, the person itself with a genoma has the full power in using uh, this, uh, this, should I open it, I close it, do I want to see what happens in the future or, or, or I don't. So I'd rather, let's say, live longer if I, if I could, so. You know, Kale, I not agree that GDPR fits well for the distributed economy because um, let's have a look from the angle of centralization, okay? We have a role for centralization calls uh, chief data officer or chief data protection officer or somebody in charge who holding the risk for everyone, okay? And this is a whole idea of centralization because there is a guy in charge. I can kill him, call him, etc. He is in charge. He is in cure all risks. The more I'm moving to distributed things, distributed governance, the less uh, the role becomes real. So the role in the end of distributed governance become a virtual role. There is no single person. Which means uh, that if I take GDPR, it's ask me, hey, you should have data protection officer. And I say again, why if I'm working for the distributed economy, why should I have data protection officer? So in terms of the current legislation, it's really industrial age, old school sucks, really. So I don't believe that GDPR is really nice stuff. If we're talking about governance model, I believe we need to talk more about what it should look like in distributed manner. What is the virtual ro role of the chief data officers there? Because there is no physical person. There is a community. It's how to manage the data across community. There is no single guy. There is a smart contracts, autonomous agents, etc. And we need to think about that instead of trying to develop some bloody 1,000 pages legislation calls on four letters. I really like this step because it was made ahead Europe, ahead of US, etc. But in the end, it does not consider absolutely, totally 
distributed frameworks, absolutely. So all our advanced technologies, all our stuff we di discuss here is missing out there, okay? Let's be honest. I want to be honest because I'm really tired to follow the old school rules, okay? GDPR took, um, I think, over seven years to create and it was released about two years ago. So inevitably, it's going to be a little bit out to date with all of these new tools. And I'm wondering, Marta, where kind of globally, and I know this is a big question, but where globally existing regulation is doing a pretty good job and where we need to be creating new principles or new rules? Sure. Yeah, in the privacy context, um, both GDPR and um, the stuff you're seeing in the United States with the New York Shield Act and the CCPA, um, as you said, uh, totally missed the mark with regards to blockchain. And there are some, some pretty major problems for the blockchain industry. The first, of course, is um, you have to be able to delete data under these um, rules. And the whole point of a blockchain is that you can't delete data. The second is, as you said, um, it, these always assume a centralized uh, database structure, which is definitely not um, the the way forward. But but also, you know, as we were talking about, if, if you if you love data privacy, right? Like there are a lot of good reasons to love blockchain. And so um, I think that the from what I've seen, the the legislators in this space are certainly not intending for this to be something that um, is too onerous for the blockchain industry. Um, and so hopefully, in the privacy context, right, we can move forward in, in future legislation. Especially for the privacy co context and the integrity, we started to pilot using blockchain technology, which was called time stamping back then already in 2008 after the cyber attack by one of our, let's say, neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so, so basically, this, uh, that, that's basically it. So, so it's, it's used. And I, I guess that uh, I mentioned GDPR because this is the only uh, this is the only achievement, I guess, in the EU uh, that uh, has been done in, in the field of, let's say, making, let's say, or giving uh, uh, some more power for the person. And, and still it focuses mostly on the banking sector. Most of the sectors are out of it. But still, I mentioned not the GDPR itself, but the GDPR principle that data is owned by the people and, and, and here. Uh, blockchain is is excellent, let's say, opportunity as a technology to uh, to use that uh, principle in in whatever kind of services. So 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 the thing with so the U.S. because of a, maybe a different uh, uh, self constitution, foundation, and so on, um, you know. So so so, you know, there's this notion of uh, when you're transacting on the internet that the other side needs to keep a copy of the transaction data for seven years for taxation reasons. And so uh, I think in the US, you can correct me, Martha, the, the idea that uh, the citizen will uh, own my data outrightly may not fly. We might have to do this joint ownership sort of paradigm where you know my telco knows my location data. They have a copy of my location data for the last 10 years. So does my bank. But you know they need to use their data to run their business, of course. Uh, but is there a way where I could get a copy of data, or they make it available in in their infrastructure, right? So that it's, I mean, as I said, my mom my mom can barely log into Amazon, let alone you know manage her personal data. So so this joint ownership might be the the better approach, at least for the United States. You know, um, in the cornerstone of all that stuff is ethics. So I'll give you an example. In one country, for example, there is a attributes that can be access, accessible by default, okay, in one country. In another country, the same attributes cannot be accessible by default. And say we're trying to change the situation <laughs> and let the people be accessible, those attributes similar in the whole countries. You make making vote, people, and they're asking, okay, looks like somebody will get my data by default. Is that okay? Is it good or not? In the country where you can access the data by default, the people are all happy. They don't care about that stuff because it's by default, okay? And then uh, what in the end? In the end, that every country have its own ethics, work with the data. But the, the human, exact human, he does not understand whether impact will be after the data will be accessible by default 
or not default. Just this is a simple example. And in the end, I personally believe that uh, human cannot understand the value of the data. So we're all lazy. I want to be lazy. I don't want to care about the, you know how many data I have, how how many consent I who I give the consent. I really don't care. I want don't care about stuff. I want that there should be a governance framework I trust. That's all I want to care. That's all. Thomas, I would love to hear from your perspective which industries are benefiting most from these types of advances. You have the privilege of connecting with myriad stakeholders. And I'd love to hear both kind of high level which industries you're most excited about um, in terms of the changes they're going through and how you engage with stakeholders to encourage some of this innovation. So let me think here. So, so definitely the, the fintech sector is, is benefiting and I, I won't talk about that because there's plenty more people in this room that are experts on this. But uh, one actually industry that, that is benefiting is actually you know pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical research. So so for those who don't know, uh, and I, I was shocked to learn this detail. So so if you're a, a pharmaceutical company, uh, on average it costs if I'm my my numbers are correct somewhere between five to eight billion dollars to fund the creation of a new drug from inception of idea all the way to FDA approval, right? So let's say you spent six billion dollars there is no guarantee that your product is going to be successful in the market, right? So there's a, there's a whole supply chain of information that, that you know, that, that supports the creation of, of new drugs. Uh, and, but then on the other hand, labs in these big pharma institutions uh, are actually finding what is called, um, you know, neg negative results. You know, uh, so, 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 you know, we tried this procedure, we tried this lab experiment, and it did not yield anything. So that's actually, you know, uh, useful information that, that companies uh, consider to be, you know, IP, right? So, so is there a way to use some of this new technology, as I said before, computation on encrypted data? Uh, if you guys know what uh, multi-party computation is, which is how to do uh, computation, uh, analytic computation across a whole bunch of encrypted data, right? So, so you could get you know, pharmaceuticals to collaborate, even though the competitors, uh, to arrive at, you know, some agreement that, you know, let's, let's not follow that, you know, lab process because, because now we know it's a waste of time. Uh, second question is, if you have to do some, you know, testing in the field, uh, you know, clinical trials. So clinical trials cost a lot of money, right? And, and one of the reasons why, the, by, why drugs actually fail in the market is that, uh, they don't actually do sufficient uh, diversity testing on a clinical trial. They say, well, let's, let's test this new drug on 200 people in this country, right? And they don't realize that, you know, the DNA makeup of the population of that country does not represent accurately the market. Just take the U.S. market right, or the European market. So, so could we use this technology, blockchain technology, decentralized technology, uh, computation on encrypted data, to advance, you know, this field, and and so we're helping some of the, you know, uh, pharma guys, and and if you, if you guys know, uh, Kendall Square near MIT is kind of the the center of the universe. If you are doing biotech research, so there's everybody's got an office there. Uh, so so you know that's a use case that actually benefits society because you know we we would like to find solutions for certain illnesses like cancer, right and. Uh, and you know uh, uh, what what new um, medicines could be could be developed using data that is available, as I said, in say in the in the in the form of the um, data cooperative, right? And so so I'm excited about that. You know, um, sure we love crypto, we love tokens, but but this is you know important for society in the future. And I think you bring up a really critical point, which is kind of a natural consequence of this digital revolution is that the gap between the haves and the have-nots is widening pretty dramatically. And I'm wondering what are the mechanisms we can deploy in each of our different industries to mitigate those consequences? Because right now, there don't seem to be that many active efforts aimed at doing that. But just as people promised the internet would democratize information, we're seeing that some of these digital transformations are creating incredible benefits 
for the most elite on earth? How do we make sure that they're also benefiting those who need them most? Well, I think one thing um, that is another cool application of blockchain in this space um, uh, is, is micropayments. Um, I actually think there's a, a ton of potential uh, in, in being able to send one one millionth of a cent across the world instantly, you know, as easily as you could attach a file to an email. Um, and there are a lot of really cool ways that you can sort of suddenly monetize things that you wouldn't have previously been able to monetize, right? So you could, um, you know, well, you, for example, you have the Brave browser, right, where you can, um, you can automatically pay the websites that you visit most often. You could have something like a paid version of Wikipedia where um, when you make a really good edit, you actually, that actually gets monetized in some way with these micropayments. Or like in my, um, in the copyright industry, um, another example is um, being able to write a program that says automatically, for every second of a song that you play on your computer, you can automatically transfer one one millionth of a cent to the songwriter instantly and without any intermediary in the middle. Um, so a lot of really cool, I think, use cases in micropayments that, that, that could help a little bit there. I'm glad that you talked about this uh, micropayments and payment system uh, as, as such. And uh, I would, let's say, continue with financial inclusion. So I think that if we talk about that kind of challenges and problems that we have talking about here, we are still, let's say, influencing, let's say, half of the world population, maybe even less. So uh, much of the population in, uh, in, in, in many of the countries are not included. So they don't have, let's say, access to the banking system that we know at the moment. And, uh, and that's probably one of the reasons why Facebook started with their own a cryptocurrency uh, project as well because uh, the conventional banking system and the states have failed in building up a let's say network as such uh, it includes both uh, let's say physical part uh, let's say this uh, hardware and also software as the market regulations and that sort of stuff but uh, but yeah they are they are doing it at the moment in cooperation probably with telcos so providing mobile internet and via that uh, the uh, the access to some sort of let's say new generation mobile banking uh, but uh, it solves quite a lot of let's say other problems as well especially in, let's say many of the africa countries in indonesia uh, and so on and so on so so this is also something that we uh, we can let's say solve using let's say this distributed ledger, let's say principle, some of the technologies and, and the new ways of communication that, that we do. And this, let's say, brings back still the, let's say, uh, hardware part as well, meaning there must be access to the internet. So in many of the countries, Indonesia, for example, so access to the internet is a challenge in many of the, let's say, thousands of, uh, of, of islands also in Africa, some of the African countries. So, so there is quite a lot of challenge through that. And there, if, let's say, a telecommunications company that owns the infrastructure is going to dominate in a way that Google dominates now, for example, I mean, in, the, in, in this part of the world, like, uh, like what, what we are talking about. I use Bing. <laughs> <laughs> then, <laughs> Then it's uh, then then it then it's let's say it brings up up uh, another challenges and then just one example what we did uh, in our very small country which is probably not the example that we could distribute in in other countries but uh, when we started uh, digging the cable basically this uh, high speed fiber cable so we didn't ga give this uh, uh, this uh, transmission let's say network. Uh, as, as this, let's say, fiber to one telco operator. So basically they founded an NGO where all, where all the telcos were, let's say, apart with an equal share and state is also one of the shareholders. And we connected, connected the mobile network first so that we could cover basically all whole country with high-speed internet, which is in mobile. So we didn't have to dig the cable to every household. And once we have a need for a more let's say speed, uh, if we fail in 5G technology, for example, so uh, then, uh, then there is always opportunity to add these, let's say, small cables. But, uh, but we have the transmission, let's say, system operator, which is 
which is an NGO, which is not, let's say, depending just one, one telco. And I think that this is good and something to copy on uh, in, in, in other countries as well where, 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 let's say, still baby steps uh, have been done in creating this hardware. I'd like to hone in on one point you brought up, which is scalability. A lot of the really compelling examples we have of these different innovations have been seen maybe in a country like Estonia. Um, but when you try to scale those for a country like the United States, which uh, doesn't have 1.3 million residents, but over 370 million residents, do we have the technical infrastructure now to do that? Is it um, a question of kind of getting public interest and support and regulatory support, or are we still kind of working out the technical glitches? I guess this is most for Thomas and okay. Alex, but... So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offend people. You first, yeah. <laughs> so, so no, we're, so I, I've said this in other events. So if you guys know the history of the internet, it was uh, funded in the 70s, 1974, 1972 to be precise, by DARPA. If you guys know who DARPA is. And the mission of DARPA, this is the Defense uh, Research Agency. And of course, it was, in the, it, it was in the heights of the Cold War. And so the defense people had this question in their mind, if the United States communications infrastructure got knocked out. I mean, literally somebody bombed, you know, some, some part of the telco infrastructure, you know, what would happen? Of course, in the, in the telco, the tradi traditional telco model, this end-to-end -end connectivity, uh, you would literally lose connectivity coast to coast. So they had this challenge uh, to create a packet-based network to allow packets to route through different parts of the network. And this is what we know today as the internet. So it took 20 years, so the internet standards protocols got standardized in the ITF beginning in the, in the early 90s, right? And so when I look at blockchain technology today, I, again, I apologize if I, if I offend anybody, I kind of feel we're in the early 90s that we kind of need another decade of research to go in there. And, and I've also complained publicly that, that so much money is being poured, private money being poured into what I, I would call speculative currency that you know, investors are in fact missing uh, on a whole lot of uh, potential opportunities for infrastructure development for blockchain, right? Just, you know, if, if you had the opportunity to invest in 3Com, you guys know what 3Com is, people who came up with Ethernet, you'd say yes, right? Just, just the way you would today, you know, if you had the opportunity to invest in Google or Facebook, you know, you know when, when Sergey was just still in, at Stanford, right? You would. So I think uh, a lot of, I'm, I'm particularly addressing private investors, that, that you should look into infrastructure, cybersecurity infrastructure uh, technologies today, invest in those startups, because those are the startups that are going to be you know, creating the cables, the ethernets of the future. Yeah, just to add a couple of sentences. Um, Sorry that was long. No, no, it's okay. Uh, you know, I, existing internet is not fit our expectation to work with semantic stuff that's the whole problem if i raise the question it doesn't give me an answer so i believe i like the I personally i like the idea of semantic web layer and i believe that we need to get this done if, without this we cannot move further i think this is the most hardest part this is the infrastructure hardware it's a like it's a bullshit we can do this today tomorrow it's not a big problem but the semantic web layer, we need to sit down, talk, and issue a standard and implement it in the next two years. Next two years, we need to do this. Otherwise, uh, we're not capable to scale the things we want to scale. So just to close up, I would love to hear from each of you um, any advice you would have for someone working to drive innovation from within an academic institution, a law firm, a government, financial institution, or other corporate. Um, what are the kind of key lessons you've learned? Let's, I mean, very short key lessons, but um, would love to get your perspectives. Me first, yeah. Sure. Okay, so I believe that's the whole point. We need to understand uh, planning is not working. Planning is not working anymore. Budget's not working. KPIs, we can substitute by AI. So I imagine the world where the management will not work as a management using the KPIs. Can you imagine this world? I can't because this is beyond my imagination, yeah? Because I still need KPIs. But now, 
whole technologies can us avoid this bloody mess calculating these KPIs. So I believe this uncertainty will unlock this potential. Try to see the new picture where it's existing uh, rules like with the very regular uh, traditional way of doing the business because you can break it in one day. Um, I think as great as it would be if uh, innovators were sort of uh, ethereal, uh, you know, on the internet, they, they happen to be corporal beings, uh, you know, in a physical jurisdiction uh, in which government officials with guns can come and, you know, take them away, right? So um, I think the regulations really, um, the regulatory piece is, is, a, is a huge issue and something that, as you've said, it's really important to engage in. It's very important to engage in, yeah. Uh, so... so what we've learned. So, so, so the traditional university research funding mo model, I don't want to say it's broken, it doesn't apply anymore. So if you guys know the Innovator's Dilemma book and you know the, the pipeline of research, it's, it's, the world is not, is, is not sort of following that model. We've got a different model. And so uh, also because the development of technology is so fast, uh, I think we need a better model to invest in applied research. We, we still need fundamental basic research, of course, the, that's, that's long term. In terms of applied research, um, I think one of the things that, that uh, industry could do is engage closer, closely to universities and say, look, you know, uh, here's a bunch of money to do something applied uh, and, and no, expecting nothing in return, okay, there's no magic. Don't expect a startup because a lot of co companies have here's a bunch of money, I, I want to start up. You know, just, just reiterate over that, right? And, and I, think, I think, I don't know what the new funding model needs to be, but I think uh, we kind of need a new one. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe it's uh, funding based on, you know, uh, s something like, um, you know, uh, com community-based funding, uh, regulators, government, you know, policies need to reflect that because in the United States, if, if you are following the news, th there has been a decrease in federal funding for universities. So a lot of, even, even MIT, uh, you know, we've had to uh, be innovative in our thinking about how to get funding and how to test some of our hypotheses. And this is why we do living labs and this is why we're working with EY, for example, and, and with, with, with you guys, GBBC. Uh, to look to, to be a, a forum where we can start to think about well how do you how do you get these universities involved in in the future generation of not just technology I'm an engineer but also you know policies right so this is this is kind of what keeps me awake and I like you know <laughs> anyway I hope I hope there was a sufficient you know good no answer. I think that's perfect and I that seems to be the perennial theme is we need increased collaboration and communication between all of these traditionally very siloed sectors. And just wanna thank you all so much for contributing to this conversation. Um, this is the last session for the evening. Um, so we will look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.